Hi everybody and welcome to my vlog. This week we're going to talk about anal fissures and we're doing this because somebody's requested it on one of the comments that they make after the vlogs and as always I say I will do it if you ask me for it. So to start with what is an anal fissure? Well to put it in technical terms it's a tear in the mucosa just inside the anal sphincter. So if you imagine that that was your bottom where the poo comes out it's a tear in the skin, just going inside this bit, which is called the sphincter. So they're very small, but they cause an excruciating amount of pain, usually once you've passed a stool, a bowel movement, but then the pain lasts for quite some time. And that's one of the typifying symptoms of an anal fissure over a hemorrhoid, in that when you have pain on a bowel movement that then lasts for one to two hours afterwards, it's most commonly an anal fissure. And as a GP, that's how we differentiate. And that's why we ask that question. It can be acute. And by that, I mean it's sudden onset, it's a one-off, and it usually resolves without much intervention in under six weeks. Or it can be chronic. And when they're chronic, they don't resolve and they last for more than six weeks. So those are the two different types that you get. So who gets them? Well, they're really common. We don't know exactly how many people get them at any one time. But we do know there's an 11% chance or just over a 1 in 10 chance that you'll get one within a lifetime. So it's reasonably high. Anybody can get them, even kids get them, but in the main, people between the ages of 20 and 40 is the typical age range in which we see them. Men and women get them exactly the same, and the acute type that get better in under six weeks are much more common than the chronic type, so that's the good news. So how do we classify them? Well, we classify them as primary, where there's no obvious cause, or secondary, where there's an underlying obvious cause, like, for example, constipation, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's, or um, sexually transmitted infections occasionally, or even rectal cancer can cause them. So most of them occur as secondary in people with constipation. So people that are passing very hard or very large stools. People that have got persistent diarrhoea get them as well. As I said, people with inflammatory bowel disease. When you're pregnant or go through childbirth, they can get caused because of straining and constipation. Very occasionally, as I said, a sexually transmitted disease. People, some people have just naturally got an unusually tight anal sphincter muscle, and that can cause it as well because of the pressure that's required to open that sphincter to pass a stall. And in lots of people, there's no clear cause at all. So, going back to the symptoms, as I've said, it's severe pain on passing a stool. But when I say severe pain, patients quite often describe it as trying to pass shards of glass. And you can imagine that is excruciating. The pain can persist, as I said, for a couple of hours after passing. And you can get blood on passing as well. Quite often bright red blood on the paper, but you can also have it in the, in the pan. And it can be quite a lot of blood and it can also bleed for a while afterwards as well because you've got an open wound. And some people get constant pain just on sitting. So as you can see, they really are quite debilitating, embarrassing because you can't talk about it, and just wrecking life really because when all you can focus on is that pain, it's difficult to do other things. So how do we diagnose them? Well, ordinarily the patient will present to their GP, to me, and we'll take that full history, including the pain duration, what your toilet habits are, how much straining there is, what your diet's like. We will have to pop a finger inside your back passage to see what's going on there and to inspect the back passage because a fissure we can usually see when we just have a look. And if we're suspicious that it's more than a fissure, that there might be some kind of underlying cause, we will refer you on to a specialist for further investigations and they will do an investigation under anaesthetic and they may even look at your anal sphincter pressures. But most of the time, because the acute type of fissures are the most common, we can deal with it in a GP practice. So how do we do that? Well, it depends firstly whether it's acute or chronic and we'll know that from your history. And the acute phase, which is the most common, they're likely going to get better on their own without any treatment within six weeks. 
However, if you're presenting to a GP, it's because you're in pain, we will treat and just the degree of treatment depends on what's going on. It's important to know that even the acute ones that heal within six weeks can come back again if the constipation, for example, continues. So we always talk about self-help self aimed at softening up your stools. So to do that, we recommend adding lots of fibre to your diet, but it's a lot of fibre. We know that the average person needs to eat between about 18 and 30 grams of fibre a day, and that's actually quite a lot. I once did an experiment on myself because my diet is really, really good, and I eat loads of fruit and loads of veg, and I couldn't get my fibre above about 12 grams a day. So it's difficult to do, especially in today's world where we're all rushing around. So good hydration is important, again, because of constipation, so lots of water or fluid of some description. And we know that exercise gets bowels moving, and if you keep them moving, your stools are likely to be softer because they're not sitting in your colon or your small intestine for a long time. Um, when they sit in your colon, water gets absorbed out of them back into your body. So that's why it's important to have regular um, bowel movements. So, What's the treatment initially? So first of all, we would aim to take away the pain. And we would do that initially with paracetamol or ibuprofen, but obviously that's not always enough. We would recommend warm baths because that's quite soothing. We might give you a topical anaesthetic, lidocaine, that you actually put on your sphincter, your bottom, just before you pass a stool and it actually numbs it, you do it about 20 minutes before and it numbs it so that you don't feel that excruciating pain when you open your bowels. We recommend not holding stool, so if you have the urge to open your bowels, to do it because holding obviously exacerbates the situation, increases constipation again for the same reason. We'd also say stay away from any wipes um, with fragrances or alcohol, and a lot of people use those nowadays for their bottom after going to the toilet. We would advise just, if you want to wash your bottom, that's fine, but just water. Um, stay away from anything that might irritate the skin. So after that, there are some medications that we can use. So um, initially, always gonna be laxatives to try and soften up the stool. Fiber gel, which is almost like gel in a glass of water, um, sorry, fibre in a glass of water is very good and we would probably start with that. It's a stool softener. And then we can go to an ointment called GTN ointment. And you will have heard of GTN for people that have angina or heart pain. Well, this is the same substance, but it's in an ointment. And if you've had the fissure for over a week and there's been no improvement, we would sometimes recommend this as a treatment. You have to use it twice a week for up to eight weeks and you have to measure out two and a half centimeters on your finger and get it right up inside your bottom so that it gets all of the relevant areas and it does work very well but about 30 percent of people do get quite a bad headache so it's a side effect that you should always know about so that you're not shocked when it happens so what and when that doesn't work and sometimes it doesn't work we see patients again would we refer you who gets referred well, if it was a child and theirs had not healed naturally within two weeks, we should refer. If it's an adult who's got ongoing pain without improvement for more than six to eight weeks, we'd probably think about a referral. If it was an adult who would had no symptoms, but the fissure is still present, so the cut in the skin is still there, after 12 to 16 weeks, we should refer. Although I sometimes wonder about that because if you haven't got symptoms, you probably wouldn't know and nor would we as GPs because you wouldn't be coming back. So I'm not sure about that one. And elderly people with new fissures, we should refer because it's unusual for the elderly to get fissures if they've got no history. And it could be that there's an underlying cancer there that's causing it. So what happens once you've been referred into secondary care? So they use some medical treatments as well. So they have another cream called topical diltiazem, 2%. And it does work, but it has less headaches as a side effect than GTN. So for some people that's a bonus because the headaches can be debilitating and then they can't use it. So that's one option. There's a blood pressure tablet called nifidipine that people can take orally, but that does have more side effects. So that's, that's used secondarily to the ointment. If things are really not improving, improving there's um, Botox. Botox is 
used for many, many things. So it's botulism toxin. Um, there is a higher recurrence rate of fissures with Botox, and you can get temporary incontinence of wind um, and poo. So that's clearly a very, very unpleasant side effect. It's also unlicensed for this use, and that doesn't necessarily matter. We use drugs unlicensed in the NHS, we just need to tell you about it. But Botox is not the be-all and end-all for this particular problem because the side effects are difficult to handle. So surgery is an option once you're in secondary care. We rarely do surgery in children. This is mainly reserved for adults. There would have to be really special reasons why we were doing that in children. So the aim of all surgery, whatever type, is to lower the anal resting tone. So that's how tight your sphincter is. We need to reduce the tightness and the tone. And the reason for that is that when the sphincter is very tight, it actually reduces the blood flow to the area, and that reduces the oxygen that gets carried in the blood to the area, which then reduces healing. So if we can lower that tone and allow more blood into the area, then more oxygen, it actually heals better. So that's the aim of all surgeries. There are various different surgeries that we can use, and I'm not going to list every single one of them because that's by no means my area of expertise. And it will be down to your surgeon to discuss with you the best surgery for you. And that's the most important thing. I will say, however, there's one particular surgery called a lateral internal sphincterotomy. And that's the gold standard, almost the best surgery. It works better than medical treatments. So the creams and the ointments and the tablets and it's got an 85% cure rate. So that's pretty high for any kind of surgery for anything. There are, however, some downsides as with anything in medicine. So there are continence issues. So 30% of people after that surgery will be incontinent of flatus or wind. So I'm afraid more farting, essentially in layman's terms. 20% of people will actually have some soiling of poo and three to 10% of people, so three to 10 in 100, will actually have leakage of poo. So it's a pretty serious consideration because those numbers are quite high. Another option is a fissurectomy where they actually um, often combine this with Botox because it's a less successful surgery. So they do it with Botox as well to reduce that tone. Um, and that's where they actually cut away the area of the fissure. Anal flaps can be used where they take skin from elsewhere and rebuild that particular part of the sphincter. And in the past, they used to do something called manual anal stretching. And to me, that sounds as hideous as it probably is. And that's not recommended now. So if you hear of that, that's no longer a recommended procedure. So not something that should be done. So having had any of these medical treatments or even surgery, what's the prognosis? What's the long-term outlook? Well, as I've said, most anal fissures will heal within two weeks. However, recurrence, recurrence is common, especially if constipation is the underlying cause and you don't sort that out long-term. With the GTN ointment that I spoke to you about that a GP can give you, recurrence is up to 50%. So one in two people will get another fissure. So it's not brilliant, um, because although they only last a short time, in that time you're in lots of pain. If there's underlying disease, so Crohn's for example, an irritable bowel disease, anything like that, then the prognosis is difficult to predict. We don't actually have any figures on that. Um, so unfortunately I can't tell you whether it's good or bad. If the fissure is chronic, so lasting more than six to eight weeks, and not responding very well to treatment. Following surgery, there is a very high cure rate, so 85%, and much less in terms of recurrence, but the long-term consequences of side effects, as I've just outlined to you, are not brilliant. So it really is a balancing up, weighing up how much this is interfering with life, and how much the side effects, if they happen to you, would interfere with life, and what would be better or worse. But obviously these are discussions to have with your surgeon. So I hope I've shown you in a brief snapshot what an anal fissure is, um, what you can do about it personally in terms of lifestyle and diet and basically not being constipated. That really is the key. 
and it's finding a food when we come to constipation that might work for you so for some people they tell me that nuts and seeds work brilliantly for some people they drink half a glass of prune juice every evening and that means they go to the toilet in the morning it's just increasing dietary fiber but it's finding one that works for you and then sticking to it and it's a case of trial and error obviously Hopefully I'll show you what happens when the fissure just won't go away or it's just interrupting with life too much and staying past six weeks and you have to go for surgery so that you can consider what things are important to you and really weigh up the pros and cons of all of the different medical versus surgical treatments that we have. But always for all of these, whether chronic or acute, alongside lifestyle change. It's a really unpleasant thing to happen but it isn't uncommon as we've said 11% lifetime, lifetime risk so if you've got that kind of pain and you've got bleeding from your bottom you need to see a GP and you need to find a solution with the GP that works for you hopefully that's been informative please do ask me any questions because if I've missed things I'm more than happy to answer them in the comments afterwards and just as this person did for me recommending a topic please recommend a topic that you'd like me to cover in the future Thanks ever so much for watching again and your continued support. It's really appreciated. Bye for now.